as well. So we're going from a big truck to a teeny tiny truck. So this is uh, a Erzberg German penny truck. And uh, it is made from wood, so it's not made from metal um, like the other ones. Uh, it's produced probably during World War I. And it is known as a penny toy. So uh, uh, toys taught, one second. So <laughs> penny toys are used, <laughs> is a name used for inexpensive toys that were usually produced in Germany between 1880 and 1914. Um, they were sold in the UK, Europe, and America in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, it is estimated that nine out of 10 toys sold in the United States in the 1800s came from Germany, which is a kind of surprising statistic. Uh, the regions of Thuringia, Erzberg, and the city of Nuremberg were integral to the toy industry in Germany. Uh, Erzberg is uh, part of the Ore Mountains area, and it was located in a very heavily wooded area in eastern Germany, uh, which was bordering the Czech Republic. This area is very, uh, is subject to very harsh winters, and many families would take part in the toy industry when they were under, unable to undertake other work. Um, children were also part of this industry. I have a photo here. Um, they may have had to work up to 12 hours a day during this time in, in uh, poor conditions. Um, toys were made in what, what's known as a cottage industry. Um, so, you know, families would make items like these in their homes and they were often very specialized. Like they may only do the painting or they may do the construction or maybe they were only making just the trucks. Oh, sorry, I guess you can't see. Better? Yes. Tiny, it's very tiny compared to the other ones. Um, so yeah, one family might specialize in only one type of animal or paint. And they, these items would be picked up by an agent um, and then they would be transported to distribution centers like Nuremberg before being sold in uh, like shipped to the States or to the United Kingdom and being sold for a penny each. Um, one other interesting fact about this area, it was known as German Christmas land and many toys associated um, with this region like nutcrackers, Christmas pyramids um, kind of came out of that area. So uh, it's, it's very, very well known for um, toy production. So there's our teeny tiny toy truck. And next we have this one, which is a little bit bigger, a little worse for wear, but again, one of my favorite items uh, in our collection. It is, it has local provenance as well. It was uh, handmade in about 1950 for the Poye family and donated by Annette Poyer in 2003. Uh, it was made by her husband for their children. Um, and I think it's probably inspired by a 1940s uh, flatbed truck. So um, she was an active member of her church. She met her husband at a card game, apparently in the church basement um, at Our Lady of Lords. And they married in 1950 and moved into their first home, uh, which was just off of Brunette uh, Avenue where Mackin House is located. Uh, she was very active in her community over the years, and uh, she was actually a founding member of Festival de Bois. So we are very grateful for uh, her donation um, of this beautiful handmade truck. And I think, you know, if you look at the front end, it does look quite a lot like a Jeep. So I appreciate that. <laughs> got that. Okay, next. Um, so the, the next trucks I should say we're highlighting are delivery trucks because I missed that part. So um, <laughs> this is a City Milk Co. delivery van uh, created by Steelcraft uh, in the 1930s. Um, it also has, uh, it's made, so but the original name for Steelcraft was J.W. Murray Manufacturing Company, and they began making stamped metal body parts for cars in 1908. Uh, the enterprising owner realized that the scrap could be turned into toys and he began making pedal cars around 1914. Steelcraft made toys for Murray, Ohio Manufacturing Company during this time. Uh, they partnered together using the same methodology that they uh, applied to automobile parts. They were marketed as Steelcraft wheel goods. Uh, by diversifying in toys, they were better able to survive the Great Depression. They also made airplanes, coaster wagons, bicycles, and smaller wheeled toys. They began to uh, make special order trucks too. So companies could um, 
order a reproduction of their full-size truck. Uh, after World War II, they concentrated solely on pedal cars and bikes, and they left the toy cars to other manufacturers, um, like Marx and Wyandotte, because they were getting quite popular. Buddy L as well. Uh, so this is a milk truck, and since milk was consumed on a daily basis back in the day, uh, families usually didn't go to the grocery store because that would be a whole trip. Uh, instead, they had milk delivered to their home. So uh, it would usually be delivered by, you know, a vehicle or a wagon. And uh, families living in our area of Merrittville um, or Fraser Mills uh, purchased or had milk delivered from the Booth Dairy Farm, which was located just down the road from us on Pitt River Road, which is now Brunette, uh, and Schoolhouse Street. So uh, I, I thought maybe this might have been created uh, for a dairy based out of Toronto that was called City Milk Co, but I was actually able to find um, an advertisement here. So we, we were talking earlier about the, the steam shovel. And if you look at this vehicle, it's actually City Ice Co. So again, that would have been just their generic name that they used. And that's part of the way that you can identify that this is a steel craft truck because it's a City something Co. So there we go. So that is our delivery truck. Now our next one isn't a truck, but I had to include it because I love it. So, and it is a delivery vehicle of a type. So this is um, uh, Rich's milk wagon and it dates to about 1950. Uh, e.m. E Rich, uh, manufacturing company uh, was founded in 1915. Uh, they produced actually wood bows for cars, uh, for open cars, and when cars were closed in, they had to diversify, so they branched out into toys. In 1927, they opened a second facility in Morrison, Illinois. Uh, in 1930, they had, uh, like following a major fire that happened in, in November 1929, they merged with the Illinois Refrigerator Company, and they also began ma manufacturing uh, electric refrigerators. Uh, they manufactured a wide range of uh, products from auto parts to refrigerator parts to toys and even water skis. Uh, they moved to Tupelo, Mississippi in 1953, and unfortunately, they went out of business in 1962 due to a flood. So this is actually known as the Little Milkman toy, and it dates to about 1950. It says City Dairy on the top of it. Um, it would actually have come with a set of milk bottles as well. And even though it says Rich's 1922, it's, it's a, you know, a, one of the nostalgic models uh, produced a bit later in, in the timeline. Um, and I was reading, you know, a lot of people remember getting this as a toy when they were younger and it's pretty cool. So there is our non-truck delivery vehicle. Okay, now as promised, here is our Buddy L uh, delivery vehicle, and this is one of the pull toys. So a, a young boy could pull it along behind him. Um, and this one dates to about 1940. Uh, according to Antiques Rocho, these are, were considered the Cadillac or Rolls Royce of the toy world um, at the time. In the 1920s, uh, not, very, not too many people could afford to indulge their children with toys like this. Um, they were very expensive and they were kind of grandfather to, you know, the other toy trucks you see today. So it is very possible. I think this vehicle was actually originally half yellow and half brown, um, but it was sandblasted. And, uh, you know, I can actually see evidence of that because there's a little bit of sand still in the cracks. And, you know, the surface is obviously stainless steel now. Uh, we have had a little bit of uh, rust issue with this, but I've, I've treated it and it seems to be holding up pretty well. So there is our Buddy L delivery van. Okay. And here we are back with another YN Doft toy. Um, and this one here is a, called a steak truck or a horse hauler. And it dates to about uh, 1950, and it's actually known as, they call these the bullet nose or uh, shark nose. And again, you'll see an example of um, tin lithograph uh, inset here for the front end. And 
we have a little bit of tin lithog lithography on the side as well. Um, this is mostly pressed steel. And, you know, the thing with these particular uh, trucks is this is a very um, distinguishable uh, cab uh, for YAN dots, and it will appear in um, multiple vehicles, I think, over a 10, 10 15 year period. Um, there's also smaller versions of, of trucks, like truck cabs that have the same kind of shape with the single windows on the side and then the split uh, windshield. So yeah, this is about 1949 to 1952 for this truck. Sorry, moving on. So, there we go. Uh, this one here is a Canadian company. Uh, we were talking earlier about Elwood Toys, and so um, they produce toys for Lincoln Specialties. And this is a Lincoln delivery truck, so we can see uh, the logo on the door, and then it also appears on the um, front of the truck. And then, of course, we have uh, Woodward's very prominently displayed on the side here. So uh, first, a bit about the company. So Mr. Ed Kimberly and his bre brother Fred out of Windsor, Ontario, began a small company named K Manufacturing in 1941, uh, making products to be used in the war effort. Uh, in 1942, they changed their name to Windsor Steel, and they branched out into portable soft drink coolers, <laughs> sun visors for cars as well. In 1943, they moved to a bigger factory space. In 1946, they opened a sales outlet known as Lincoln Specialties. Um, at the corner of Lincoln and Erie Streets in Windsor, Ontario. And you may be wondering if they are associated with Lincoln Logs, and they are not. Lincoln Logs date back quite a bit farther. Um, so uh, they advertise as hardware specialists, and they were hoping, out, hoping to branch out into new markets uh, when the war ended. Uh, obviously, again, there was an abundance of scrap metal at this time. And so they decided that they would repurpose their tool room because they already had a lathe, a shaper, and different milling machines to make the die to create pressed steel toys. Uh, so they began, you know, to experiment and they started making their own toys. They specialized in trucks at first, uh, dump trucks to be uh, specific. They usually, the earliest models were usually red and yellow. And Lincoln and Elwood Toys produced toys for Lincoln Toys, for Lincoln Toys specialties in, until the late 1950s. Uh, even though their company disappeared, the influence in the design of the cabs can be seen in uh, future toys as well. Apparently, this is a rare model um, of a Lincoln truck. Uh, it is one of the more prized Lincoln models, and it doesn't appear in many Lincoln uh, catalogs, so I'm wondering maybe if this was sold out of the Woodward's catalog. Uh, Woodward's, for those of you who are watching in BC, uh, you may or may not recognize that name. Um, it was a company uh, which operated in BC and Alberta for 100 years before it was sold to the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, in 1892, the first Woodward's was established at the corner of Main and Abbott Streets in Vancouver. Uh, the company was incorporated in 1902 and a new store was built at the corner of Abbott and Hastings Streets in Vancouver. Charles Woodward was the original founder of the store. Uh, he, many people used the store via mail order catalog and, you know, people were able to order goods uh, from Vancouver. They were distributed all over the province up into the Yukon. Uh, it was in publication from 1892 to 1953, and it claimed to be the great mail order house of the West. Uh, people could order groceries until about 1963 through the catalog. That, I thought that was pretty cool. There are 29 stores in BC and Alberta. Uh, the company was acquired by Hudson's Bay in 1993. So uh, this delivery truck dates to late 1940s, early 1950s again, and it is one of four vehicles that we have from Lincoln Specialties in our collection. So. I was very excited to see it when I saw it. So, okay, our next one, next delivery vehicle is also uh, made by Lincoln Specialties. So I won't go into the history again. Uh, this is about 1954, I think, 1950, 1954. Um, and you'll notice it has these lovely little cars on it. And I, these are actually not original to this piece. So uh, when I was looking at them, they were made by the Reliable Toy Company and they're plastic. And so uh, this truck would have had to toy cars with it, but they would have probably been metal and they would have had the Lincoln 
auto logo on them. Um, so they're each identified. We have a Jaguar, we have a Mercedes Benz, um, and a Rolls Royce, and I think a Porsche uh, on this particular truck. So um, it's a pretty cool example. We can see the logo on here and on the front end as well. And it is, again, an older model because it has this uh, front end that has been cut from a separate piece of steel and then adhered to the front end. Um, so I think that's all I really have to say. Yep, that's it. So there's the lovely Canadian uh, toy truck. Okay, now we would be remiss without talking again about the Marx Toy Company. So this is a, an example of a very well-loved uh, Marx delivery uh, semi-truck. And it dates to about 1950s. And again, there is tin lithography all over the surface of this truck. It says Gold Star Transfer Company Nationwide Service. And it has, you know, the United States. So this was obviously produced in, in the States. And again, they have a very distinctive front end, which is a separate piece of metal, but it's been uh, tin, it's made from tin and uh, it's been lithographed as well. So the tires say made in USA and they also have the Marks logo on it. And we can see the Marks logo at the back end as well. So that's it for our delivery trucks. And now we're going to talk about fire trucks. Oh yes, we're gonna, now we're gonna take just a short break uh, so we can get them all set up because we have various sizes. Some of them are quite large and we're gonna need some more table space. So we'll be back in less than a minute. Assist. Hello, and we're back. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about fire trucks, uh, which is very relevant. Um, we're all, you know, uh, dealing with the smoke and I can only imagine how the people in the States are feeling right now. So my heart goes out to you. Um, anyway, <laughs> we're gonna talk about fire trucks. Uh, fire trucks have held a fascination with people for a very long time. Uh, they first appeared as a toy around 1888 and they were usually made from cast iron or tin plate. Um, they came in different models, including pumper wagons, uh, horse-drawn wagons or ladder wagons at this time as firefighting technology changed over the years. Uh, so did the toys. So uh, you'll probably recognize this guy from our uh, very first toy, and he is a cast iron fire truck. And this one I was actually able to research and identify. I believe it was produced by A.C. Williams in 1910. I was not able to find much about the company aside from the fact that they came out of Ravenaugh, Ohio. So if you do have more information, please do share that with me. Um, authentic Williams toys were usually made in two halves, as you can see here, um, and then they were riveted together, and they are usually unmarked. So there is no markings on this. I had to basically research and, you know, I uh, spent a lot of time looking at fire trucks. So there you go. That's our cast iron uh, fire truck from 1910, and this is a steam pumper, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. I'll put him over there. And uh, next is the uh, Dayton fire pumper. So this, if you remember our previous discussion about Dayton vehicles, they were the ones that you pull back and then you let them go and they'll whir away. Um, it is a hill climber friction toy, uh, early press steel. Uh, they were, you know, usually mass produced. So they tried to use a minimal amount of parts. The whole, the body of this particular piece is made from one part that's just been kind of cut. Um, and then there's other uh, pieces adhered to it. Uh, these types of fire engines relied upon uh, technology that was actually originally designed to help pump water out of mines. Um, after several attempts and failures, <laughs> one model uh, was actually destroyed by an angry mob uh, due to its failure. The steam-powered pumper eventually helped to extinguish fires. So uh, the first reliable steam pumper used by a fire, fire department could heat steam in just under four minutes and the steam actually helps to push the water out of the fire hose. Um, the city of Cincinnati commissioned a model to be built for its new fire department in 1883. Uh, even though it was reportedly self-propelled, it still required four horses to pull it, which I thought was really funny. 
Um, the pumper, it didn't last very long, the, the, the first one made. It, it actually exploded at a trial in 1855. Um, so steam, steamers like this one could hold up to, or could pump up to 500 gallons per minute, which was quite a lot uh, more than a hand pumper, which could only pump 200 gallons per minute. And uh, usually, so that you have the boiler part here, and they would have to light a fire underneath. There would always be hot water running in um, the pumper, or sorry, in the steam vat, uh, but they would have to superheat it when they would get called out to a fire. So they would use rags soaked in kerosene to kind of get that heat going and then they would drive to the fire and by the time they got to the fire they could pump the water out of the hose uh, at about 30 to 80 psi so uh, steam pumpers were used to put out fires from the mid 18th century well into the 1920s so that's our steam pumper and again it's a Dayton toy and uh sorry here um so this we have next is a another teeny tiny toy. Um, this is our uh, penny toy fire engine and it dates to about 1910. Um, it is a ladder truck. So, you know, the main purpose of this would be to kind of provide a ladder so that firefighters could get up to upper levels. And, you know, as uh, buildings changed over time, they needed longer and longer ladders um, as, you know, fires would happen at higher and higher elevations. So uh, the introduction of lithography sheet tin at the turn of the century enabled toy manufacturers to produce very inexpensive toys like this one out of tin. Uh, many were made in Germany from about 1900 to 1930 and they were sold on street corners at dime stores for about for a penny each. They did not survive very well because they are really quite delicate and the few surviving penny toys uh, have become quite valuable. This particular piece, there's one side, which is really nice, um, and the paint has really stopped the rust from taking over, but the other side, uh, we have quite a lot of, of rust on the surface, and again, on the underside as well. But, you know, considering uh, it's, what, 110 years old, this is a, a pretty, it's in pretty good condition. So, there we go. And we're gonna go from very small to very big. Uh, so, when I say these were made out of automotive steel, it's pretty heavy. It's almost as heavy as a car, <laughs> probably not, maybe not. That's an exaggeration, I know, but uh, it's pretty heavy. So this is a Buddy L uh, fire engine from, oh no, this is not, this is a Keystone. So this is Keystone fire engine from 1930. Um, and this is the Packard fire truck. So Keystone actually had, um, they, they uh, made Packard fire engines. Um, so it is along each wheel, there is a keystone stamped and these are, you know, made from hard rubber. Um, the Keystone Manufacturing Company of Boston, Massachusetts launched into the production of Keystone Press Steel Toys in 1924. Uh, with the approval of the Packard Mo Motor Company, they patent their toy trucks after the very, uh, well-known and highly visible at that time Packard truck. Um, over the next 25 years, Keystone produced many magnificent toy trucks, airplanes, uh, trackless trains, and other uh, construction toys. They were one of the first manufacturers to actually bring real water spurting fire trucks to the market, um, as well as other innovative designs and patents, including a uh, working air pressure pump under the hood of the water, water spurting fire trucks and the hydraulic lift dump trucks. And so later, Keystone uh, introduced the Rydum series of toys beginning in 1932, and I do have, I do have a photo of that somewhere. Hold on, let's look here. Um, one of their competitors was the Sunny line of toys, right here. And they had the, the Rydum series of toys. Um, I might have not included it. Okay, never mind. We'll, we'll post it. Um, so they phased out uh, the Packard name on their trucks in 1937. So this is uh, probably pre-1937 and they introduced a new cab and uh, hood profile. And actually the uh, uh, White Rock Fire and Rescue, um, they have a pack, real Packard fire truck that was uh, restored and it's absolutely beautiful. So there is our Keystone fire truck, got it? Okay, and now <laughs> we have our Buddy L fire engine 
So Buddy L also produced uh, toys that you could ride on. Um, this is the ladder truck for Buddy L. And um, probably, can you get that? So underneath the uh, steering wheel here, we have Buddy L quality toys. And it's, it says Moline pressed steel as well. And it says it's an aerial ladder truck. Um, the ladder here is actually hydraulically operated and it is, uh, reportedly extends up to four and a half feet. So that's quite large. Um, the, uh, it's about, it dates to about the 1930s and it has CFD, which maybe stands for California Fire Department on the side of it as well. And again, this is uh, typical of a uh, Packard uh, body shape. So there is our Buddy L fire engine. Got it. <laughs> um, uh, next, we have a Lincoln fire engine, and this uh, dates to about 1940, and it was made by Lincoln Specialty. So you'll remember our Woodward's truck and our Lincoln uh, toy car hauler that we were looking at earlier. Um, it has a removable ladder, and actually, the when you make the car go or the truck go there's a little hammer here that will go back and forth and hit the bells. So uh, it has a uh, cool action on it. And again, we have the typical uh, Lincoln toy logo on the hood of the truck. And then it says Lincoln Fire Department on either side. And it is an older model, again, because it has the, um, the front end is actually cut from a separate piece of steel and then it's, uh, it's held onto the top with tabs. Next we have, this lovely example of tin lithography, and it's actually from Japan, and it dates to about uh, 1950, and it is created by Marusan um, uh, Shoten, which is a Japanese model and toy company that was founded in 1947. Um, its headquarters were located in Taito, Tokyo, and uh, they were most famous for introducing plastic models and for selling uh, PVC kaiju monster toys in the 1960s. Uh, the company, though, can trace its, rate, its roots back to 1923 uh, when Naokichi Nio, Ishida founded uh, Ishida Manufacturing, and they were located in the As Asakusa area of to Tokyo, which is actually known for toy manufacturing at the time. Ishida mainly produced toy binoculars um, and telescopes for the local market in the, its early days. After World War II, uh, toy Production was encouraged within the Japanese uh, economy as a way to recover and repair the damage from the war. In uh, US occupied Japan, uh, toy production, oh, sorry, uh, the idea was to have high cost, high labor economy with very little profit. Um, so metal stamping was very popular at this time and the flow of metal for production began to pick up as the country slowly rebuilt. At the end of the war, post-war production was very, was very difficult and many uh, factories had been really heavily damaged during the war. Uh, there was very little transportation available beyond walking or cycling. So assembling teams to staff factories uh, was challenging uh, and keeping up supply chains proved even more difficult. So uh, many com companies actually outsourced the uh, finishing uh, or assembly of toys to the domestic market. So factories would deliver toys like this to people's homes where they would be painted and or assembled and the completed toys were then picked up and returned to the factory for boxing and distribution. So Mara, Marusan, the company that produced this was founded in that difficult environment by um, Ishida's sons, Harusayu, Minoru Ishida and Yasayo uh, Arai. And they founded the company together in 1947. They uh, grew up around the toy factory. So they had uh, you know, some base knowledge about manufacturing at the time. And they began carry on, carrying on first with telescopes and binoculars. And then they branched out into tin toys like this one. Uh, Maru means circle and San means three. So that's where their uh, logo comes from. And they officially changed its name uh, to Maru San Shoten in 1950. Uh, they began manufacturing toys that usually perform some kind of action. So this guy here, his hand, you can see his hand waves. And um, this is a friction toy. So if you, know, you pull it back, it'll go forward. Um, they also made uh, tricycles, dolls, uh, other figures, jets, birds, and other animals. Um, so the post-war period, as we may or may not know, it, 
created an economic boom and it increased uh, demand for items like this. Uh, more people had disposable income at this time and more time to play. So, uh, you know, the, the first really modern culture based on consumption was kind of started at that time. Um, so Japanese toy producers kind of saw uh, demand and so they started to create toys specifically for the American market. And this is uh, one of those toys. Uh, American occupation of Japan lasted until 1952, uh, increasing the exposure of Japanese people to American popular culture and the consumer goods that were featured in magazines. Um, they were already considered uh, experts at toy manufacturing, um, and that dates back to about 1930. They expanded in 1950s to produce a series of uh, tin lithograph toys. So a lot of the time when you're looking at tin toys from that period, it's really not surprising to see that they are made in Japan. Um, in the uh, late 1950s, uh, the company Marusan began exporting toys to the United States, and this is one of them. And they also uh, started to produce plastic model kits. Uh, you, mostly, they're most well known for their submarine model kits at that time. In 1966, they introduced the Ultra Kaiju PVC uh, figurines, which they're famous for as well. And this is one of the earlier toys for the company, and it has a you know, friction motor with really vibrant colors and a lot of detail on it. Um, and these uh, firefighters are actually dressed in Japanese firefighting gear. So the, the helmets that they wear actually have a, um, like a hood that comes down to protect their neck while they're fighting the fire. So there we go. That is our fire engine from Japan. And now I'm gonna, these are, our next toy is, uh, will we'll contain a character that's probably very familiar to many people. And that is Mr. Mickey Mouse. And we have Donald actually riding on the back um, and he's holding on to his hat for dear life. Um, so this is made from rubber and it's actually made by the Viceroy Manufacturing, which is based out of Toronto, Ontario. And uh, this is part of the donation. You remember that lovely handmade wooden truck that I featured earlier? Uh, it came from the Poirier family, so it was uh, used uh, locally by their kids. Um, it dates to about 1950. So uh, Viceroy uh, also produced rubber balls along with Beach Boys and Beach Boys, Beach Toys and <laughs> Bat Toys. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, so in the 1950s, they partnered with Sun Ruko, which is the Sun uh, Rubber Company out of Barberton, Ohio, to produce uh, a popular line of Walt Disney toys and um, they, they produced them in Canada for Canadians. So that's pretty cool. I was really excited when I saw these. And there's also a uh, Mickey Mouse, so there's Mickey Mouse fire truck, there's a tractor, and there's a Donald Duck Roadster. So we're definitely gonna fe feature the Donald Duck Roadster in our next talk. So keep your eye out for that. And it's just really cute. Mickey's head actually spins. I'm not gonna do that. And then, you know, there's Donald and he's, He's actually a part of the truck because apparently Mickey's driving too fast. So there we go. And next, uh, we have this tiny guy here. And this is a Hoobly fire engine from about 1960. A lot of the paint has uh, chipped off of this particular piece. Uh, we can see the Hoobly logo on the inside. And, um, you know, this is made from steel. Uh, it's probably, it's die cast steel though. And, you know, the there's a ladder on the back and then there's some uh, rope, not rope, there's some hoses too. And this particular piece, uh, uh, Hoobly was incorporated first in 1894. We're gonna talk more about them in our next uh, talk with the featuring the cars, just because we have a lot more Hoobly cars in our collection than we do trucks. And they also made uh, horse-drawn vehicles, tractors, steam shovels, fire engines. Uh, we have a, a bank, actually one of their banks and guns. And they attempted to break into the model train business, uh, but they failed and ended up having to sell off their stock. The company has changed hands several times, but today they still produce uh, high-end, uh, really detailed modeled cars um, that are sold as kits that you can make. And you know, a lot of older, not older adults, but a lot of <laughs> adults enjoy making themselves a nice Mercedes Benz or, um, you know, uh, Lamborghini, etc. So that's Hoobly. Then we have this poor guy who's missing a wheel. And this is a Matchbox fire engine from about 1964. And it's very small. 
and it actually says Kent Fire Brigade on it. Um, so there are some marks throughout, and again, some of the paint is worn off as well. Uh, Matchbox was a British toy company that was founded in 1953, and they made uh, toys that were, you know, small enough to fit in a Matchbox. Um, not the, you know, the flip ones that we see today, but the Matchboxes that were a little bit bigger. Um, it is now, the company is now owned by Mattel. It was purchased in 1997, and it was uh, their first major success, uh, successful toy sold by the company uh, was a uh, model of Queen Elizabeth's coronation couch. So that's, you know, interesting. They didn't just make trucks. Uh, so additional models were added throughout the decade. This is a ladder truck and it's pretty detailed, but again, this is die cast. So um, a lot of the detail is part of the actual mold itself. And next we have this really cool, uh, this is not a truck, <laughs> as you can probably tell. Uh, but I wanted to include it because I, I really liked it. And this is a, a Fire Chief bicycle bell and it dates to about 1950. And again, it comes with its original box. And a kid could mount this on his bike and then it would go, ooh, 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 ooh which is pretty cool. Um, I was not able to find out too much about the company that made this bell. So uh, if you can let me know more, it's made by Ranger Steel Products out of New York. And next we have this, which is actually incomplete. Um, and this was made by Mark's company and it is a firehouse. So it's a general alarm firehouse. And actually one of my favorite parts is this cool guy standing in the doorway here watching all the recruit, recruits being trained. <laughs> and originally this would have had a base and there would have been um, two fire engine tracks and they, you could have released them and they would have gone uh, out. So that's pretty cool. It dates to about 1950, 1938 to 1939. So it's one of the older pieces by the Marx Company. And then last but not least, one of my favorites. So Marx & Co, uh, climbing fireman, uh, circa 1948. And it's made from, this guy is made from plastic and he's got a clockwork mechanism in him. And once he's wound up, he would climb up and down uh, the ladder and He's got a painted face. He kind of looks a little creepy, but you know, there's only so much you can do when it comes to plastic molding. Um, yeah, so that's our, our last guy and we're gonna post a link so you can see kind of how he works. Uh, so check that out. And if you have any questions, let us know. Um, the companies, the toys they produce, a bit about the cultural context they mirrored and transformed. Check out our website for more blog posts in the future. And our next discussion will be on uh, cars and roasters and jalopies and that will be uh, that will be featured uh, October 16th so thank you very much for your um, hi <laughs> thank you very much for your patience I'll try to make the next one a little bit shorter and I appreciate you tuning in are there questions or is it are we too late now perfect thank you so much we just have one question for you um, and so this question was about the um, the dumper trucks toys yeah. Um, and the question is, were these side dumper real trucks or just toys? Were they, uh, if you know if they were just created to be a toy or if they were modeled after a real truck? Uh, I actually don't know, but I would assume that they probably would have been a real truck at some point. And probably it wouldn't be logistically that uh, practical. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> and so they probably changed the model, but I will look that up and I'll make sure to include that uh, in the future post. Perfect. Uh, I think that was the only question that we had. Um, so thank you so much, Jasmine, for all of your information about these trucks. Um, and yeah, like Jasmine said, our next um, one is on October the 16th, I believe you said it was. Um, so check out our social media, our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for more information about that. And you can always check out our website as well. Over and out. Awesome. <laughs>